Hey guys, we're going to talk a bit about intelligence. I know there's other things about cognition in the chapter, but we're going to focus our discussions and what you're responsible for on intelligence. Okay, so let's start by thinking about what intelligence is. And there's going to be a slightly different um, answer here, depending on whether we're talking about what uh, psychology has historically uh, thought of about intelligence and what we're thinking now. So because um, it's changed and it used to be that we had this idea of what was called G, the letter G, uh, which stood for general intelligence and the idea was that um, if you were smart, you were smart in all ways and if you were less smart, you probably were less smart in all ways and that there was just this general sense of intelligence. You were smart or you weren't smart and it is kind of how we talk about things in some ways culturally when we think about intelligence we talk about someone being smart um, and yet as you move through life as you move through your academic life for sure you know probably that you seem to be more skilled at some kinds of things than other kinds of things that perhaps some of you know you're really good at writing but less good at math or some of you know that you're really good at math or science and less good at writing um, and so and so um, there's kind of this mismatch and more and more what we focus on is that um, the idea that uh, we, in fact, G is not where we wind up and that we wind up with a more multifaceted approach to thinking about intelligence. Um, psychologists also are fascinated, or historically at least, have been fascinated with the idea of measuring intelligence. That psychology as a discipline in this country really kind of comes into its own uh, during World War II when the Army uses psychologists to measure intelligence of potential soldiers and to measure soldiers in other ways psychologically and that's really kind of where we can date back our thinking about intelligence. Um, so when we think about more modern theories of intelligence we really are thinking about this multifaceted idea um, and it used to be that intelligence was really those traditional academic skills kind of reading writing arithmetic right the three R's um, and that um, even now if you think about how often you think of someone as being smart you might automatically kind of think of that in terms of whether they're good at school um, but we really are moving away from that to thinking about maybe other kinds of interacting with the world, other ways of succeeding in the world that have nothing to do with whether you do well in a classroom. And the major way uh, of thinking about this comes from somebody named Howard Gardner. And Howard Gardner proposed the idea, and still proposes, the idea of in, uh, multiple intelligences. And this circle, I think, really... Um, uh, demonstrates this nicely. I like the fact that it has images in it as well. But one of the important things of all of these intelligences that he said, gives to us, the seven that you see here, um, the, one of the important thing to pay attention to is that he makes the argument, two arguments. First, that each one of these relies on a separate brain area and in that way is distinct from each other but also connected to the brain um, and, it, and connected to distinct uh, or specific parts of the brain. And Howard Gardner, I think, very successfully makes the argument that if your brain is causing you to be able to do something that that is intelligence that that there's not some brain processes that are about intelligence and others that are not and so we can take some time here to look at this wheel um, and if we come to where's my cursor there it is um, if we come here to word smart and logic smart these two together verbal linguistic and logical mathematics this is traditionally what um, leads to success in school Right, so you can write, you can understand words, you did well on spelling tests and vocabulary tests, you learned to read easily um, when you were a child, and that's verbal linguistic. Um, and logic math is that science and math skills that uh, also are really important in school. And so that's really, whoops, sorry. Um, and so that's really where um, traditional intelligence uh, approaches stop, that we think about those and only those. And so the rest of this is what Gardner adds. Um, and we can come up here and work our way around. We'll come back to naturalistic, but we come up here to visual spatial, right? Picture smart. The visual spatial intelligence um, is what we use if we're reading maps, um, but also if we are doing art. Um, if we're navigating our way through the world in various ways. And so there are people who are just good at those things. Um, and, uh, and, and Gardner uh, tells us that that is a kind of intelligence. Musical intelligence, the next one up, 
is just what it sounds like, about the ability to be good in areas of musical uh, performance or composition or even just understanding. Um, and there are people who particularly are good at that, right? Who pick up an instrument or pick up multiple instruments and just seem to be able to do that um, you know, with less work than it might take somebody else. Bodily kinesthetic intelligence is often one of the ones that is most surprising to people and yet um, I think it's really important to think about. This is about your, being a, your brain being able to move your body and use your body in a really effective ways. Um, the easiest way of thinking about this perhaps is with athletics um, or dancing. Um, that some of you know you are able to dance and control your body in really impressive ways and others of you know that you watch other people doing that and you have no idea how their brain can tell their body to do that. Um, and so the idea that um, people who are good at moving their body and using their body in various ways, that, that is a kind of intelligence as well. Um, and then we have these two that are opposite each other. Um, we have interpersonal intelligence and in, um, intrapersonal intelligence. Interpersonal intelligence is about, right, the t these two together, I should say, is often what we mean when we talk about emotional intelligence. Um, and interpersonal intelligence um, is being able to um, read other people well and perhaps even manipulate other people well, uh, but certainly push other people towards, uh, you know, convincing them to do the things you want them to do or to see things the way you see things. Um, salespeople have to have high interpersonal intelligence, but I would argue that teachers need to have high interpersonal intelligence, that uh, the ability to read and think about things from other people's points of view requires really good interpersonal intelligence. Um, and then intrapersonal, the self smart over here, is about how good you are at reflecting um, on your own process and how good you are at um, at uh, knowing where you will succeed and where you won't, and therefore making good choices for yourself in various ways. Um, and so people who have those two, um, self and people smart, the intra and interpersonal intelligence, um, really come across and function as being um, uh, emotionally intelligent. Um, and then let's come back to this nature smart, because this is uh, an, an, a later edition by Gardner. It wasn't there in his original set. Um, and that is about understanding the natural world. This might be about animals, this might be about plants, it's about navigating your way perhaps through forests um, or other places. Um, and there are people who are simply good at that and good at that in ways that um, may seem um, surprising to others of us. Um, so make sure you take a look at Gardner stuff um, because it, it's really an important way of understanding modern approaches to intelligence. So if we take all of that and think about how we currently define intelligence, Robert Sternberg uh, is a cognitive psychologist who de simply defines intelligence as the ability to succeed in life. And I think that that is a really um, interesting way of approaching it. We have to think about what do we mean by success, um, and success probably means monetary success or at least professional success. Also, might, it probably means relationship success, and those would be the main areas. Um, a commonly accepted definition is that intelligence is the ability to think rationally, so to think clearly um, and well, to act purposefully, and so to make decisions and then act on those decisions, um, and to adapt successfully to your environment, which I think is the most important piece of this. Um, adapting successfully to your environment environment means wherever you find yourself that you are able to succeed in that place. And we're going to come back to the idea of uh, intelligence being culture bound, but, but people who are smart are able to adapt to, what, to the environment they find themselves in, but by the time you're an adult, you probably have developed specific skills. You've probably developed specific skills um, that are going to make you better able to succeed in the environment you've existed in and give you a harder time succeeding in other environments where you have not adapted um, over the course of your childhood and adolescence. And so someone who looks very smart in our culture may not look so smart in another culture um, if they are plopped there in the middle of adulthood. Um, and so um, we often sometimes define intelligence as how you do on tests, especially things like intelligence tests, but that is not the best way of defining it. The other thing to understand about intelligence 
is that um, if this is not the same as performance. So people can have IQ, high IQ and do poorly at school. People can ha have high IQ and um, not succeed in various ways for other reasons. Um, and IQ is thought to be a stable thing. So it's not so, it, you know, that people with the lower IQ might work harder and earn better grades and earn better professional status. Um, but that doesn't change their IQ. Um, starting around age four, we see IQ as a fairly stable thing that um, that if we do rank order. So how you rank among your peers. If you're among the smartest four year olds, you're probably going to be among the smartest 14 year olds. Um, and that the more stable a child environment is, the more stable their IQ is. And, and another way of thinking about that is if, if that environment makes more of a difference if it's changing radically than if it's stable. If it's changing radically, you might see a child's IQ go up and down more. Um, poor environments seem to have a snowball effect um, so that children in poor environments, if that environment stays poor, and by poor we mean uh, the child is neglected, the child is not treated well, the child isn't given um, uh, interaction and opportunity to um, grow their IQ, that those environments um, that assuming it stays that way, the child will do increasingly poorly over time um, from as a result of that environment. Um, and then IQ becomes even more stable during adolescence, and adolescent IQ is highly correlated with um, IQ like when you're in your 50s um, in middle age. Um, and in adulthood, IQ is really predictive of some important things. Um, if, probably not surprisingly, it predicts occupational status and financial status, um, but it also predicts lifetime health. And in, in this way, right, that people who are um, have higher IQs are more intelligent, are more likely to access information and education about health in various ways. They're more likely to be able to make good decisions for themselves about health. And so um, that's an, an, an interesting correlation as well. Um, and if you want to protect your IQ as you age, because we can see dips in IQ as we age into um, the, the elderly years, um, staying in good health, living a stimulating lifestyle, and continuing to learn throughout adulthood will protect IQ. And we'll come back to those ideas in the human development chapter as well. All right, so we're going to stop there and pick up with this um, when we uh, in the next uh, class.